Good morning, everyone. Um, so my job is to give you a little bit of background for everything else that we're going to hear today. I'm going to start very briefly on the benefits of physical activity, which most people are aware of. There are so many benefits of physical activity. This is one of the main reasons that we care about sports injuries. We want to keep everyone active and healthy. The multiple benefits of physical activity include physical benefits, decreased risk of obesity, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, psychological benefits of decreased depression, increased self-esteem, academic scholastic benefits of keeping kids in school longer, and also the social benefits of being on a team, being involved. In terms of sports participation, the last 30, 40 years have seen a huge increase. Since 1972, Title IX, and um, we, in 72, it was said that you cannot discriminate based on sex in any educational program. And this was a tremendous push forward for female athletics, but also for athletics in general. And we've seen a tenfold increase in high school participation, fivefold increase in college participation, and currently, there are about 35 million kids in the U.S. participating in sports. There are about 54 million children between the ages of 6 and 18, and about 70% of them are involved in some type of organized sport. The graph on the bottom here, let's see if I can get the, uh... all right, we give up on the pointer. But um, let's try a different one. All right, no technology. Um, so if you look at the graph, this is from the Women's Sports Foundation in 2008. The graph on the, the pie chart on the left is girls, the one on the right is boys, and we see that about 69% of girls between the grades 3 and 12 are currently involved in some type of organized sports. That's compared to 75% for boys. So although we're doing well, we're not quite equal yet. These disparities continue to exist, not just in terms of male and female, but in terms of socioeconomic status, racial differences, the urban-rural divide. And these disparities are something to keep in mind throughout the day, because if we want to advance the health of the entire population, we need to better understand why these disparities exist and find ways to address them. So not only have we seen an increase, ah, thank you. I think that was the only slide I needed. Thank you. Um, so not only have we seen a tremendous increase in the number of kids participating, but we've seen fundamental changes in the way that kids play sports. So we've seen growth of organized sports, a much higher level of competition, especially early on. Kids are starting at four and six in really high level competition. Where kids used to have an on season, and off season, or at least some time off, currently some kids play all year round. They play on multiple teams. And we'll hear about this during the day, how this increases the risk of certain types of injuries. There are also risks that are inherent to the young body, to the growing athlete. Things including pressure to compete, their growth cartilage as they continue to grow, nutritional issues, variations in physical development that happens between kids of different ages. And we'll hear also how these inherent factors affect the risk of different injuries. So I know it's early, and I just wanted to give you a couple of numbers to frame the, frame the problem. Two numbers, 7,100 and 11 billion. 7,100 is the number of kids that are seen in the emergency room every day with sports injuries. So again, this is every day, 7,100 kids. That translates to about 2.6 million visits per year. And $11 billion is the cost of providing that emergency <coughs> care. Obviously, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of health care and cost because it does not include all the care that they receive through school nurses and trainers and primary care doctors, sports medicine specialists. It does not include hospitalizations or surgeries, rehab, medications, braces. It also does not include the indirect cost of parents taking kids to their appointments. And it doesn't include the cost to those kids who may not get full care who may, because of injuries and other problems, just drop out of sports. If we look specifically at high school athletes, there are about 2 million injuries per year. That translates to half a million doctor visits and about 30,000 hospital, uh, 30, hospitalizations. We also know that sports and overexertion are the number one cause, the most common cause of injury-related visits to the primary care doctor. So again, $7,100, $11 billion, really just the tip of the iceberg. And these are the bad numbers. 
This is the good number, 50%. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, estimates that 50% of all sports injuries are preventable. And I think that's why we're all here early on a Sunday morning, because we know that there is so much that we can do to prevent many of these injuries. And obviously, we will never prevent all injuries. We are still human, and life is still dangerous. But there are so many different things that we can do, and that's what we're here to learn about today. When we talk about prevention, we often talk about overuse injuries and acute injuries. Overuse injuries, by definition, are repeated microtrauma that occurs over time. So because these injuries build up slowly over time, things like stress fractures, tendinitis, there are multiple opportunities at which we can intervene to stop the injury from ever developing or to stop it from progressing. And we'll hear about this later today, especially in the breakout sessions, running injuries, dance injuries, hockey injuries, throwing injuries, all of these have some overuse injuries, and we'll talk more about how to prevent them. But not just overuse injuries. There are also sudden traumatic injuries, things like concussions and ACL tears, that can also be prevented. In terms of concussions, it may be about changing the way that kids play, the rules, the things that will bring the kids at highest risk, trying to change that. In the ACL tears, looking at the way that kids stabilize their knee, the way they move, and trying to find vulnerabilities to make changes now before the injury occurs. One of the great things about prevention is that there are so many different levels of prevention. And that's one of the great things about the McKaylee Center and other prevention programs, because we want to work with the athlete at whatever point they're at. Ideally, we would like to completely prevent the injury. We'd like to evaluate the athlete before they've ever had a major injury to see if there are vulnerabilities, imbalances, weaknesses, things that we can change so the injury never occurs. Unfortunately, sometimes we can't do that. An athlete's already had an injury, already had a stress fracture, an ACL tear, ankle sprains. So that's a window of opportunity. The person has already had an injury, and we want to look at what imbalances exist, what may have led to that original injury, and what we can do to change whatever they need changed so that the in there's a lower risk of that injury occurring again. In some cases, we're just trying to get the injury not to get worse. If someone already has a stress reaction, we don't want it to go on to stress fracture. If someone has a concussion and has symptoms, we never want them back onto the field um, where they could be bumped and the symptoms get much worse and last much longer. And ultimately, we're trying to prevent chronic diseases as well. So if we can prevent an ACL tear, then we're also preventing that increased risk that comes years later of osteoarthritis. And if we're keeping kids active and healthy, then they have a better chance of becoming active, healthy adults. And we know that exercise will help reduce their risk of heart disease and stroke and osteoporosis and diabetes. So keeping kids active and healthy will help them throughout their lives. And I just want to leave you with uh, a model. This is the Richmond model. Julius Richmond, who was a Surgeon General, was asked, how do we make changes in public health? So I'm adapting it a little bit to sports injury. But he said you need three things. You need scientific knowledge, social strategy, and political will. Scientific knowledge, we need to understand what these injuries are. We need to collect data. We need surveillance programs. We need to be able to recognize the patterns so that we understand these injuries better and figure out ways that we can treat them. We need strategies. We need interventions that we test and we understand will help prevent these injuries in the future. We need individual strategies, working with each athlete to identify their individual and unique needs, but we also need population-based strategies. We need to look at whole teams or whole areas or whole sports to figure out a way to reduce the risk for everyone. And then we need the will. We need the motivation and the funding and the resources to really put these changes into action. So in summary, the burden of these injuries is way too high. Prevention is absolutely necessary and absolutely possible. And I want to thank all of you for being here today because there are things that we can all do to help put prevention into practice. Because our goal really is to keep everyone active and healthy for a lifetime. Thank you very much.